We are all experiencing an unprecedented time in our lives right now. The level of uncertainty, anxiety, and fear can be overpowering. As we learn to navigate in our new world, all doing our part, whether it be social distancing, staying home, and abiding by federal guidelines, there are so many on the front lines who are battling a war against an invisible enemy. Being on the front lines can place a person's physical and mental health in jeopardy. A team of professionals has come together and created a program called Resilient Minds on the Front Lines to bring tools, knowledge, skills, and instruction to assist in a time of need. This team is dedicated to helping those who help others. On today's webcast, our guest speaker is John Wayne Troxell, retired senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Secretary of Defense. John served 38 years in the Army and was involved in five combat tours. John talks about how those on the front lines can have invisible wounds and how to overcome the stigma that seeking help is a sign of weakness when it actually is a sign of strength. We thank you for your service, John. Your hosts for today's webcast are Master Resiliency Instructor Michael Pellegrino and Dr. Michael Wiltsey, Arlington County Prosecutor's Office and Licensed Psychologist. Resilient Minds on the Front Lines was created to bring you 15 minutes of hope in a world turned upside down. The topics in our webcast are all meant to help those on the front lines help themselves and others. Today, John Wayne Troxell's message is an impactful one. John talks to us about how anger can come from fear and grief. As first responders, we all have the invisible wounds because we face abnormal circumstances every day. John tells us how important it is to not resist help. Being vulnerable takes a lot of bravery and it is so important to recognize the wounds of our past and seek professional help. John, congratulations on your retirement. Thank you for your service and for all you do in helping others on the front lines. Be safe. Be healthy, be resilient. I want to take a moment to thank, um, today we're going to be with SEAC John Wayne Troxell. And first, I want to sincerely thank you for sharing your wealth of insight and experience with us today. Um, and to that end, if you could just give us, uh, and I know it's hard with the wealth of knowledge and experience that you have, but if you could give us an overview of um, your experience, I would really appreciate that to give us some context. Oh, thanks, Kate. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here today. So my name is John Wayne Troxell. Uh, I just retired recently as the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Secretary of Defense, the senior enlisted person in the Department of Defense. I spent one month shy of 38 years in the Army and uh, serving all over the world, five different combat tours, including Operation Just Cause Panama, Operation Desert Shield Storm, twice in Operation Iraqi Freedom, and once in Operation Enduring Freedom. And as the SEAC, I spent the majority of my time traveling around the world to gain the pulse of the force for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense to such places like Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, Libya, uh, South Korea, and uh, many other places in South America in the Pacific. And uh, since I've retired, I uh, worked for several uh, military support and veteran support organizations. And my key focus has been to get after assisting veterans with employment, but most importantly, to get after the epidemic we have, uh, which is veteran suicide, and how to uh, build uh, and be part of teams that will get after driving that number down to zero, because one suicide is one too many. And so I'm honored to be able to uh, continue to get after that fight now as I'm retired. Absolutely. And I'm humbled and honored that you're here with us because you've truly had the opportunity to go to all corners of the world and really get a pulse on, you know, what makes people both struggle and overcome. And you have a unique, such a unique perspective that I think offers so much to us. So to that end, um, I want to ask you, how has your unique experience and perspective situated you and your perspective really to think about mental health and our overall well-being and resiliency? Well, you know, uh, I first got exposed to combat, like I mentioned, in 1989, December, when I parachuted into combat in Panama. And it was my first opportunity to be again, go against an armed enemy, but also 
unfortunately, to see American soldiers killed in action and, and brought home in flag draped coffins. And at the time, I didn't think it had an effect on me, but uh, through subsequent uh, combat tours, um, it continued to have an effect on me in terms of me being angry all the time. And I just thought I was just this crusty old Sergeant Major that, uh, you know, was angry, but I didn't realize that it was having an effect on my family. There was never any physical abuse or anything like that. But sometimes when you're, you're, you're bothered by grief and fear, which are the two key factors that drive the anger for uh, post-traumatic stress, um, you don't see it until somebody else sees it. And I was uh, on my last year as the SEAC and my wife came to me and frankly, she uh, gave me an ultimatum. She said, look, we're getting ready to end this 38 year career and all of this is gonna be gone and it's just gonna be us. And uh, we can't live like this with uh, how angry you are all the time. You need to get some help. So initially, you know, I went to seek behavioral health uh, to appease my wife. Um, but once I got in and, and met my provider, my therapist, Gina, who is still my therapist to this day, even as I'm retired, um, it was amazing to me the insight she had on what was going on inside my head. It was almost as if she could read my mind in terms of the grief I was dealing with from losing 54 men and women in 2007 and 8 during the surge in Iraq and having over 500 severely wounded. And then as the Sergeant Major of all forces in Afghanistan, 2011 and 12, losing 332 service members and having over a thousand wounded. Um, I didn't realize it was grief that was driving this anger, but it's also, it was driven by fear, fear of not being prepared. And, you know, it, it is normal for someone that has had abnormal circumstances, whether they're in the military, they're in law enforcement or a first responder, to do things like when we could go into a restaurant, go into a restaurant and make sure you have eyes on the key avenues of approach that are into and out of the restaurant. And you sit with your back so you can see the doors uh, to include the door where the uh, kitchen staff goes in. And it was because of that fear of not being prepared or to see a threat come. And that is just normal for someone that's been in abnormal circumstances like places like Syria, Iraq, or Afghanistan, or a law enforcement professional that's been on the front line and has had to do something that uh, had them do an escalation of force and have to go through a, a near-death experience. Or for our first responders now during this coronavirus uh, at pandemic, that every day they go in to harm's way by going in to treat patients that have this infectious disease. And so um, there, regardless of what we do, there's always this uh, kind of focus on, in the military, it's you know, telling the enemy surrender or die, that if you surrender, we'll treat you humanely uh, and we'll give you due process, but if not, then we will kill you. But we also have to understand that the invisible wounds of war uh, tell us inside our head that we have to stand or die, meaning we have to stand up to the inner demons within us. And we have to understand that it, it's our uh, mission to seek help. And also that we leaders uh, associated with that individual have to understand that we shouldn't create a stigma of holding it against somebody because they wanna go seek help. As I said before, these are normal reactions to abnormal circumstances. Uh, and people just have to understand that. And the more, we bring understanding to it and we continue to get people the help they need. And even if it's just to talk about it, like me, I don't get medicated. I don't have a service dog. I just have someone that I can talk to once a week that will allow me to talk about the things that are on my mind and have been on my mind for 30 years, ever since I first went into combat. And I can walk away and have a productive week after that because I feel like a million dollars after I've had that discussion with a, a mental health professional.
Absolutely. And I think that's vulnerability takes a lot of bravery and that's the mark of true leadership and why I respect what you're saying so much is to be able to be so authentic. And I think that's what resonates from your message is that you can be honest and authentic and that gives other people the space to do that too. And when we talked, you and I spoke about those hidden invisible wounds and, you know, carrying them that it takes to carry them from your experience, what helps in coming to that place of adversity and also coming to a place of over helps us to overcome it so that we can have that post-traumatic growth. We can use that resiliency to work through adversity. So this is very important, Kate. And uh, I just want to make sure the audience understands from a military context, Every day in combat, when someone gets ready to go and do their mission, whether it's go out on patrol or to do a deliberate attack or go out and do something, um, or if someone is getting ready to deploy for 15 months into a combat zone and they know it's gonna be dangerous and deadly, mentally and emotionally, they will cross over. Meaning this, first of all, no one wants to go and die in combat. No one, no law enforcement professional wants to go and get into a gunfight with a criminal and end up losing their life. And they certainly don't want to take anybody else's life if they have to. A first responder does not want to go in and end up treating uh, COVID-19 patients and contracting the COVID-19 uh, 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 virus themselves. But because we know we're going to go and do our job, and we know that the enemy gets a vote, uh, regardless of, of whether it's an insurgent, a criminal, or a virus, um, at a certain point, mentally and emotionally, you cross over to deal with the, the fact that, that you may not come back from this. Physically, we're still here, and we're still doing our mission, and we get after it. And I think that's some of the re reasons why you see some very heroic things happen in combat, on the front lines, and through our first responders is because mentally and emotionally we have crossed over to say this isn't about me i'm going to take care of the person on my left and right and if i have to die today then i'm going to die that is uh the selflessness of being a military member law enforcement or a first responder now and please i, I hope people understand the bad news is the vast majority of us survive those incidents physically. So we have to cross back over mentally and emotionally to come back home to being a father or a mother, to living in a safe environment in the most sovereign country in the world, the United States of America, and that we have to continue to do the things uh, that make us a solid citizen. But those wounds of the actions we've been in in the past are still there. And the mannerisms and the standard operating procedures and everything is uh, that we've been doing are still there. So when we see people doing things like a car pulls up alongside of them when they're walking down the street and all of a sudden, if they're a military person, they assume a low ready position with an invisible rifle. It's because in combat, anytime a car pulled up like that, they had to be suspiciously alert about it. In law enforcement, if you see someone with a weapon out in the, in public, even though they may have an open carry permit or whatever, automatically that light goes off that says, hey, this could potentially be a threat. And the same with our first responders in terms of what goes on uh, when you're dealing with an epi or a pandemic like we're dealing with now. So the best thing about that we can do is to tell people you're normal. The abnormal circumstances you've been through, you're having normal reactions to that. And that's okay. And the best help we can give you is to send you to a professional that deals with mental and behavioral health to get after that. Some, it affects worse than the others. And some may have to, you know, take medication or may have to have a service dog or may have to have other things to help them combat that. But the, the number one sticking point is the stigma of seeking help. And the best thing we can do as a nation is to say, it's okay if you need to uh, seek help. We need to make sure that saying, I need help is as macho as 
I'm going to go defend freedom and kill the enemies to our nation. That has to be as macho uh, as uh, what we do in combat. Absolutely. And I think you're bringing up so many important points and especially that crossover because so many people working right now and, and in these positions are okay with being selfless and going into that moment. But the hard part is when you have to return to whatever normal is supposed to be that doesn't look that way to everybody else around you. So I'm going to ask you a hard question, but we're talking about a hard topic. If you had to give a takeaway today, some you know, some advice, and you've given us some great advice to ask for help. What, what would be that first step that someone listening right now, what would you give them as a way to build their resiliency and to have hope that they can find that normal? First and foremost, uh, do what I didn't do. And I, and I was in denial for 30 years. Um, uh, and if someone is telling you that potentially you need help, you need to, to listen to that person. I think the best thing we can do as an individual is first make sure we take care of ourselves, that we're looking out for our own health, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And second of all, if we're doing something that people are looking at, especially our families and saying, hey, something's not right with you, then we need to act on that. And we need to act on it immediately and get the appropriate health, or appropriate help. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I'm so grateful that you shared that with us because I think coming from you, the message resonates so strongly with so many people. Um, and, you know, a, a favorite proverb of mine is that you can't pour from an empty vessel. So helping yourself first is really so key. Um, is there anything else that you want to share today that I haven't uh, touched upon? I, I just... Uh to all the, the men and women of the United States military, all the men and women of our state, federal, and local law enforcement, and all first responders out there, we all live and work in an environment that a lot of adversity and, uh, and abnormalcy uh, happens on any given day. And our reactions to that abnormalcy aren't abnormal, they are normal to that kind of profession. And we have to understand that first and foremost. And second, if that's starting to consume us through uh, what looks like post-traumatic stress uh, in terms of anger, grief, fear, and things like that, we need to opt for, as you said, Kate, the post-traumatic stress growth, not the post-traumatic stress disorder, which can be even more harmful uh, than some of the things that uh, harmful to others than some of the things that we could potentially do to ourselves. And we just got to continue to normalize that it's okay to say, I need help to deal with these invisible wounds I have. Absolutely. And thank you. I am absolutely humbled and inspired to speak with you and, you know, to give such a real message and such a message of hope. I couldn't be more grateful. And, and I really want to thank you for your time. Kate, thank you so much for all you do. God bless you and God bless America. Hi, I'm Mike Wiltsy. I'm part of the team here at Resilient Minds on the Front Lines. In today's video, we heard a critically important message concerning trauma, stigma, and mental health wellness from recently retired SEAC John Wayne Troxel. This is a man who spent almost 38 years of his life devoted to service to his country in the Army, including five combat operations. He is clearly a courageous warrior, dedicated serviceman, an experienced and intelligent leader. And I am sure he has delivered highly meaningful and motivational messages and speeches throughout his long military career. But messages like the one that he delivered in this video are extremely high in significance and impact to so many servicemen and women, as well as anyone in frontline occupations, and to all humans for that matter, who have experienced traumatic events. John Wayne Troxell simplified and normalized the truth about experiencing critical and traumatic incidents. They affect you mentally and emotionally, and that is normal. But his message also advised us that what needs to also be normal is openly expressing this to each other, embracing this truth and engaging in therapy or counseling. 
John Wayne Troxell summed this up beautifully when he stated, the number one sticking point is the stigma of seeking help. He stated that the best thing that we can do as a nation is to say it's okay if you need to seek help. He added that we need to make sure that saying I need help is as macho as I'm going to defend our nation in combat. That is such a powerful and needed message. These events have an effect on us psychologically. Our presenter today called them invisible wounds. He reminded us that these wounds can be expressed as anger, grief, fear, guilt, anxiety, depression, or other emotions or behaviors. He also reminded us that we need to understand that these are normal reactions to abnormal events. We need to understand that they can affect us and negatively impact our lives if left unchecked. Resiliency training programs like those in the military and in law enforcement are designed to teach individuals skills for enhancing one's ability to cope with daily stressors, critical incidents, and acute and cumulative trauma. But sometimes you may need more than this, and that is at the crux of John Wayne Troxell's message. Therapy can not only help you manage your current stressors, but can also help you build resilience and mental health wellness for future stressors. Thank you, John Wayne Troxell, for joining us today, for your service to this country, and for your continued support to mental health wellness and suicide prevention to military and veterans support organizations. Your message is strong, acknowledging that vulnerability equals strength. For someone who presents as macho as they come, your calling that asking for help should be viewed as just as macho as going into battle is genuine and authentic and undoubtedly is sending a message of hope to our viewers and anyone that has the privilege of hearing that message from you. Be safe, be healthy, be resilient. During the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, your mental health is vital. Please see the resources listed here as well as on our website at onthefrontlines.us. You are not alone.